Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, The Gospel of Luke, Dr. McLuhan introduces Luke's gospel with a focus on the seven unique stories he presented on the life of Jesus. No better introduction to the Gospel of Luke could have been given than the one that Dr. Luke gave himself. This is what he said, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Don't you want to know the exact truth about Jesus and live in all the blessings that he has to give to us? So many scholars believe that Luke researched the life of Jesus while Paul was in prison at Caesarea. He had two full years to go through Judea and Galilee and interview people whose lives were touched by Jesus. I'm sure this doctor had thrilling conversations with people who were healed from incredible, incurable diseases, impacted his life in a very deep way. A few weeks ago, I introduced uh, Dr. Luke to you as a person, and I encourage you to listen to that message on my YouTube channel at Dr. Peter McLuhan. Uh, Luke wrote more of the Greek New Testament than any other author. In all, Luke contributed 52 chapters to the New Testament. What a blessing to have so much of the New Testament written by him. If I were asked to pick just two books from the New Testament to take with me to a remote island, I would take the Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles. That was what I would want to feed my soul on in such a remote place. I love these two books. I've spent many years visiting the locations where the events happened and sharing with others what I have learned from those sites as I was there and felt even the legacy still to this day of the presence of Jesus. Now, each of the gospel writers had a particular style or audience in mind as he wrote. Matthew primarily wrote to a Jewish audience, showing that Jesus was a direct descendant of Abraham and King David, very important in the Jewish community. Mark wrote to a fast-paced audience, a next generation. It's a fast-paced gospel uh, with people who are the tick-tock kind of thinkers. So if you're in that generation, study the gospel of Mark, and then when you're ready to get a little bit more about the teachings Jesus gave, move on to the other gospels. Luke wrote to a more scholarly, in a more scholarly manner, appealing to Greeks and Romans and to Jewish thinkers, Luke saw in Jesus someone who could bring all the peoples of the world together. This is what he said. People will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Aren't you so glad it's a worldwide gospel that's drawing people from every continent and every part of our globe? Luke chapter 13, verse 29. Now, the gospel of Luke can be divided into four sections. Simply put, the journey to Jerusalem, chapters 1 through, or to, excuse me, the journey to Bethlehem, chapters 1 through 3, the ministry in Galilee, chapters 4 through 9, the journey up to Jerusalem, chapters 9 through 10, and then ministry in Jerusalem, excuse me, chapters, <laughs> the journey to Jerusalem, chapters 9 through 19. And then the ministry in Jerusalem, chapters 19 and 24. Obviously, there's some lap over. Some of those chapters divide right in the middle. And rather than give you all the verse numbers, I wanted to give you a broad brushstroke of how the Gospel of Luke is laid out. In the first section, the journey to Bethlehem, we find a collection of beautiful songs. And the most well-known of these songs, of course, is the Song of Mary. Who could not be moved by these beautiful words spoken by a young lady I believe to be no more, uh, no older than 13, 12 or 13 years of old age when she conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. 
My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 48. So in addition to Mary's songs, we find in the Gospel of Luke, the song of Zechariah, the song of the angels, and the song of Simeon, all in those first three chapters. Uh, Luke gives the most information about the birth of John, John the Baptist, and the birth of Jesus. He is the only writer to record the details of the shepherd, that tremendous encounter, the angels encountered them on the hillside. Uh, They were out on the hillside because it was lambing season, by the way. That's why they were with their sheep in the fold as they uh, had gave birth to their young. And so they made their way to worship Jesus in the manger. What a beautiful experience that must have been. Uh, Dr. Luke sums up a transition from the birth of Jesus through his formative years, 18 years in all, are summed up with these simple words, Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and favor with man. I hope that's the goal of your life, to increase in all of these areas. So wisdom, statures, physical favor, social uh, favor with God, spiritual, and favor with man, of course, is our social growth. Jesus was what we would like to say is a well-rounded person, And may God help us to be that kind of person. Uh, Luke had a unique style of writing. He drew attention to medical details. You'll find him using the word touch more than any other of the gospel writers. Luke focused on Jesus' personal ministry with individuals. You see Jesus touching people, touching a leper. Remember, if you've watched The Chosen, his disciples were frightened for Jesus to touch Jesus that somehow he could catch leprosy. Aren't you so glad Jesus can't catch what you have? (laughs) And when he touches you, you lose what you have, and he doesn't get what you had. What a great God. He emphasized the place of prayer, how important that is. He gives women a place of prominence in both the gospel and in the book of Acts, mentioning Some women by name and others without name, over 13 times he calls attention and elevates the role of women in society, just like Jesus did. A delightful discovery to make in the Gospel of Luke are the stories that are not found in any of the other Gospels, including John. These uh, unique stories are placed in all four sections of the Gospel of Luke, and they are fun to discover. We've already learned about the first one. None of the other Gospels write about the angels and the shepherds and unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Um, Next, we learn about raising of the widow's son. That's found in Luke chapter 7. The story of the Good Samaritan is found in chapter 10. It's one of Jesus' most well-known stories. I bet if I ask you to give me a few details about the Good Samaritan, you wouldn't have any trouble telling me just a few details. Now, you'll remember it was prompted by a lawyer trying to outsmart Jesus. I'm telling you, that's always a bad thing to do, whether you're a lawyer or not. He asked this question, who is my neighbor? Luke chapter 10, verse 29, and Jesus goes on to tell this wonderful story. The story of a man who had been robbed on the desert road from Jerusalem to Jericho. The key in the story is that it was going down, not up. A Levite and a priest passed by who'd finished their duty. They had no reason not to touch him, but they ignored him. But a good Samaritan took care of him. How many of you had help from a good Samaritan? <laughs> in the course of our lives, somebody's raised up a good Samaritan from an unexpected person. And may you be that unexpected person in somebody's life this week doing good in their lives. Uh, He ended this powerful parable by asking the lawyer, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? Luke chapter 10 and verse 36. Boy, he didn't want to answer that question. He was just saying, "Mm." (laughs) hmm. But Jesus forced him to say the words. They wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. Reluctantly, the Jewish lawyer was forced to admit that the Samaritan was the good neighbor. 
And the Samaritan did what the Levite and the priest should have done, but were unwilling to do. Now, the fourth unique story is found in Luke chapter 13. Before reaching Jerusalem, Luke wrote that Jesus visited a synagogue where he found a woman who was bent over and not able to stand straight up. You ever met somebody like that? And just look down. And symbolically, there's so much about it. When you look down, you just can't look up. And our help cometh from above. <laughs> we got to look up to get help. And if you just bent over, it's hard physically. And sometimes it becomes hard emotionally and spiritually to look up. So Jesus freed her from what he called a disabling spirit that had gripped her for 18 years. Can you imagine being in that condition for 18 years, somebody in this room or watching us today has suffered from something for a long time. It might be 18 years, might be less, and might be even long, longer. Jesus wants to free you today. He said to her, woman, affectionately, don't, don't get that in the wrong tone, you are freed from your disability. <laughs> How do those words feel? To you, just hearing me say them, and speaking to them to you the way Jesus spoke to that lady. Persons listening, I free you from your disabilities. Luke chapter 13, verse 12. If you are carrying a disability, I release you with the same power that Jesus was set free. In her case, it was a demon who prevented her from standing up straight. Not all diseases are connected with demons, but some are. And Jesus called demons like that a spirit of infirmity. If you find yourself thinking devilish thoughts, it could be, you could be suffering from a spirit of infirmity. And I break all spirits of infirmity off of all of us in the room today and any watching online. I break it by the Spirit of God and say to you, you are free of your disability. I think particularly of children who are carrying dyslexia, children dealing with ADHDA, like, like I've been set free from so much of that dysgraphia and all of those things that hold our children back. In Jesus' name, be free from the attack on your enemy for your brain to work and for you to be successful in life. The fifth story is the healing of a man with a swollen leg and we would call that, the Bible calls it dropsy. Does anybody know what dropsy is? I, you know, I, I never connect with the word dropsy. It's edema. It's the re water retention related to many different kinds of diseases. Uh, but if you have swollen legs, if you're dealing with edema, edema from any particular reason related to your heart or anything else in your body, I command your, your edema, your swelling to go down and for the, for the water retention to pass, for your swelling to go down, and for your legs to return to normal. <laughs> you feel a word on that today? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Release your healing power through this word and through those who are listening into the lives of those listening today. I'm going to jump to the seventh story. It's found in the last section of the Gospel of Luke. In this story, two men were walking to the town of Emmaus to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection. And this story is found in Luke chapter 24. Jesus joined these men as they were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and he acted as though he had no idea what they were talking about. And so they said to him these remarkable words, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there or here in these days. Luke chapter 16, uh, chapter 24, and verse 16. And Jesus said to them, what things? And they said to him, things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. Now that's a key phrase for Luke in, all, in both the gospel and in the book of Acts. It's not about deed, it's deed and word, word and deed. It's talk and walk matching together. Jesus was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. 
and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and to crucify him. Luke chapter 24 and verse 20. Now they spoke to him about the rumors that were spreading. Rumors were beginning to fly around Jerusalem that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. What good rumor that is. (laughs) When they stopped speaking, Jesus spoke. When Jesus spoke, it makes a difference in our lives. I'm hoping Jesus is speaking into your life today as you hear this message. O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Luke 24, 25, and 6. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He interpreted to them all the scriptures, from the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. Verse 27, (laughs) when Jesus is the preacher, our hearts are changed, our hearts are warmed, we understand, our eyes are opened. I'm praying that some watching today will have their eyes opened to see the scriptures in the past, in the before books about Jesus that he himself fulfilled. So wouldn't you have liked to have heard that sermon? When they reached their home, they uh, compelled Jesus to eat with them and even to spend the night. They were offered Eastern hospitality. Of course, they had to, and he accepted. As they passed the bread to Jesus, and Jesus opened his hands to receive the bread, their eyes were opened to see the nail print scars in his hands. And as soon as they recognized Jesus, Jesus vanished. In shock, they turned to each other and they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, on the road, while he was opening to us the scriptures? Luke chapter 24, verse 32. Now, I hate to do this to you, but you're going to have to read the rest of the story for yourself to see what Jesus did next. Can you tell I'm just pulling you to read uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke? So I hope your heart is burning as you are, uh, as I've led you through this very brief summary of the Gospel of Luke. Now today is Sunday. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving in America. Thanksgiving is a time when we remember that God worked mighty miracles in the early days of our nation. And without the help of God, we would not have become the people, the nation that we are today. And even though many Americans have turned their hearts away from God, there is still a remnant. You are part of this remnant in this room today who recognize that it was the hand of God who made our nation the envy of the nations of the world, the people of the world. I've traveled to 70 nations, and everywhere I go, somebody will say to me somewhere on the journey, when they find out I'm an American, they will say, my greatest ambition in life is to come to America. They'll worry about all the bad things people say to America in a heartbeat. They'd get on a plane and come here. Every week online, someone asks me to help them immigrate, to come and be in this great nation. And so with all of this in mind, I have chosen to end the message with the sixth story that is only found in the Gospel of Luke. We've already had a reference to it today, if you're in the whole service on the way to Jerusalem. As Jesus was about to enter a village, he was met by ten lepers, I think this is the largest collection of of completely hopeless people that Jesus ever encountered. They stood at a distance. They were required to stand at a distance, crying out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. I wonder if there's somebody in this room crying out right now. Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Somebody watching online, you need mercy from God. And Luke says, when Jesus saw them, this is all he said. We have no other words than these. Go, show yourself to the priests. Luke chapter 14, verse 17. 
Now, they understood what that meant because if you had leprosy, you had to go see a priest and have the priest examine you and say, you didn't have any signs of any skin disease on your body. We're talking about people who didn't have toes and fingers. We're talking about people whose noses were eaten off. We're talking about people whose ears are half gone, if not completely gone. We're talking about people who are hobbling along, can't even walk straight. And in that condition, Jesus said, go and walk. Walk to Jerusalem. I don't know how far that walk was, but it was a significant walk for a, for a sick person to make. And it was in the going that something happened. If you just stood there and looked at Jesus and didn't turn to walk, you didn't get anything. But if you turned and walked in the condition you were in, by faith, God was going to do what you couldn't see. And I, I don't know how they all turned at one time. If one had, there had to be a leader. And somebody said, well, if he's going, I'm going. If he's going, I'm going. If he's going, I'm going. If she's going, I'm going. And I'm telling you, somebody needs to lead the way. Who's going to lead the way here to help people get to the place of declaration of being whole? It was a fascinating story for Dr. Luke to record because Dr. Luke heard the testimony that they were not healed when Jesus spoke to them. And he'd had plenty of testimonies of people who healed right instantly in front of them. But this one had a delay on it for a very particular reason. As they were, they were healed in the journey towards Jerusalem. And then this remarkable thing. They did what they were invited to do. And in the process, they were healed but Luke records this. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Luke chapter 17, verse 15 and 80. What, what, what a remarkable story this is. You feel that? You're just feeling something bubble up inside of you? Uh, it's a very powerful story. And there is a deep lesson found in Jesus' response to the one who turned back. This is what Jesus said. Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Yeah. I'm telling you, foreigners show us up all the time. The foreigner will show you up in a heartbeat. The foreigner will know what he gets when he gets God. Thank you, Jesus. Listen carefully to the added blessing that the one who fell at the feet of Jesus received. He got something the other nine did not get. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Luke chapter 9, verse 17. Now, the others were cleansed, but the man was well. And what's the difference? And how do I know what I am saying to you is true? Jesus gave the one who turned back to give thanks, not only physical healing, but emotional healing. When Jesus said to the man, you are made well, he used the word zozo. And it is a Greek word indicating complete and total health in every area of our body. This word denotes more than physical healing. It is emotional healing. In the case of the leper, it meant that the shame was gone. The stigma associated with the disease was gone. It was lifted off of the spirit. His isolation was broken. He could touch and be touched. The orphan spirit that he carried was broken off of him. His relationship with God was taken to a whole new level of intimacy that it never occurred to him would be possible to have. Yeah, who wants to be Zozo? The nine were healed, but their minds were still messed up. And God may have brought more blessing into your life than you ever imagined that you could have. Some of you look back and say, I never thought I'd come this far, but unless... Your emotions are healed. You'll not be able to enjoy your blessing or to live free. Amen. Giving thanks 
On this Thanksgiving, I'm inviting you to be more than grateful to God for his blessing. I'm inviting you to fall at his feet and let him heal your emotional wounds. Allow him to release you from every hurtful thing that's ever been said or done to you. That's what we need. Fall at his feet and let all of the goodness of God come down upon you. So if you've been diagnosed with cancer or some incurable disease, I release a great healing today. What a report. I release to 10 people today freedom from cancer. And I release to a greater number of people freedom from the cancer of emotional wounds that are eating you just as bad as that physical disease eated eight people up. I release to you the blessing of God. If you've never turned to Jesus for salvation, I invite you to turn to Jesus today. This is what Luke said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, many people think that's the key verse of the book. Uh, Deep in your heart, you know you're lost. You have no assurance in your heart of what will happen to you after you die. Jesus came to die for you in your place on the cross. This is what Jesus explained to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And if your heart has been burning within you as I have been speaking, pray with me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me in my place on the cross. I receive you today as my Savior. Give me the gift of knowing that I'll be in paradise with you the moment that I die. Fill me with your spirit. Heal my physical and emotional wounds. If you just prayed with me to receive Jesus as your Savior, or were healed while listening to this message, write to me and we'll send you more information to help you grow as a follower of Jesus. Father, forgive us for the times that we receive your grace and don't turn back and look into your face to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Today we say it. We look to you, Jesus. Thank you for your kindness, your generosity in our lives. Thank you for salvation that you bought for us. Release us from rejection, shame, or anything from our past life that still wants to hang around. May we be fully whole in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.